The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our series, Key Battles in the Revolutionary War. After a very bad New York campaign, the Americans are on the upswing with the heroic victory at the Battle of Trenton the Battle of First Trend, as some people call it, where the American forces are able to defeat the Hessian forces, catch them completely unawares when they're hungover after their Christmas celebration. So now we're going to see what happens in the aftermath with the Battle of Second Trenton and if the Americans are able to keep the momentum of victory or if they're going to have some more hardships come in. Where are we at, James? What's happening now? All right. Well, after the momentous victory at Trenton, uh, Washington realizes that he doesn't want to stay on the New Jersey side of the river, the or uh, the east side, in other words. He could be subject, if he tries to stay in the, the city or the town of Trenton, then he could be subject to an, a, a counterattack by the Hessians or some British forces. So he recrosses the Delaware back into Pennsylvania, taking the prisoners and captured supplies with them. I forgot to mention that in the last episode, but Washington captured many much needed supplies. I mean, just think about the shoes. It's yeah. kind of, yeah, no, hopefully I don't know that there were enough for every single American that needed a pair of shoes, but uh, you would get quite a few off of the, the it's kind of ghoulish to say this, but off of the dead guys <laughs> and uh, you know, you could get better coats, blankets, as well as uh, bullets and powder and things like that. So lots of, lots of good stuff picked up there. Um, Washington was expecting a British counterattack. So what he decided to do is recross the river again. This will be the third crossing. So he had gone, again, before the battle, he had gone across from Pennsylvania to New Jersey, attacked Trenton, then after the successful battle, crossed back into Pennsylvania. Well, now he's going to go back into New Jersey again. His uh, his men must have been going, what, again? (laughs) Why? Um... But anyway, so they crossed on December 30th, and they decided to deploy the army in Trenton after on the south side of the Assunpink Creek. And there the soldiers are going to build fortifications. So he decided, after all, instead of just going back into Pennsylvania, let's stay in New Jersey, let's stay in Trenton, and let's meet the British head on, but let's dig in and and prepare for them so that we'll have a fighting chance. Some, by the way, I said that they were on the south side of the Aston Pink Creek. Everybody check a map on that one. Uh, but for that reason, sometimes this battle is called the Battle of the Aston Pink Creek. Uh, other people call it the Second Battle of Trenton because it does actually occur in Trenton. All right. So what happens? Let's go on. Uh, okay. Remember how I said the enlistments were up at the end of the year? Well, we all know the end of the year is December 31st, right? And this is December 30th. So Washington realizes, oh boy, I'm, I'm like a day away from losing my whole army. He knew that many of his men's enlistment were due to expire the next day. So he made an appeal to them to re-enlist. And he supposedly said to his men, he assembled them, lined them up, and he said, if you will stay one month longer, you will render that service to your country that might not be possible under any circumstance. And the men just kind of stood there and they were thinking, hmm, one more month versus warm bed (laughs) back home, my wife or my, you know, whatever, uh, my farm. But finally, after an awkward silence and a pause, one man stepped forward and then another man stepped forward and then another. And they just kept stepping forward, uh, almost like Hollywood fashion. You know, I guess that's where they got the idea from. I don't know. You see this all the time. Who's with me? And one person comes forward, and then another, and another. But, um, so it really happened here. And before long, nearly all of Washington's men agreed to stay. And one of his officers said to him, uh, should we get them to sign something? <laughs> you know, should make it official. Washington said no. Men who will volunteer in such a case as this need no enrollment to keep them to their duty. So pretty neat, huh, Scott? 
That's a very stirring story, and I'm going to sound like a total downer the next thing I say. If there's any doubt, let's just default to believing what James says. Now, I think I read somewhere else that Washington offered a bounty of $10 to everyone who'd remain another six weeks, and that was what alleviated the problem. Yeah, that helps. A little bit of cash helps, too. And he didn't have the authority to do this, by the way, but he he said, well, desperate (laughs) times call for desperate measures. And I don't know how this was all partitioned out or if it was the same group or both things happened separately, but... The first one is more stirring or interesting, so let's just go with that. Yeah, let's go with that. I mean, I have read it in some good sources, so if it didn't happen that way, it should have happened that way. But the point is, is that whatever, by some means, Washington persuaded most of his army to stay. That's the most important thing. And the reason it's so important is because Cornwallis had 8,000 troops by now in Princeton, New Jersey, not too far away, and he sends... 5,500 of them, by the way, Cornwallis, his furlough got canceled. I didn't mention that. (laughs) Uh, When when they heard about Washington and his army over there, uh, William Howe said, you know, General, maybe this is not the best time to go to London. We kind of need you here. So poor Cornwallis had to, you know, he had to forfeit his ticket. (laughs) Christmas has been canceled. Christmas break. I I think it was a non-refundable ticket. But anyway... (laughs) So Cornwallis is very grumpy at this point. He sends 5,500 of his men to attack Washington on January 2nd. Happy New Year, George. (laughs) One day late. Washington sent a force under the command of Colonel Edward Hand to to march north. Okay, so remember that uh, Trenton is just north. It's on the bank of the Delaware River, and Princeton is to the north of that. So Washington sends a group to to be the greeting committee for the British (laughs) Army. They deployed at Five Mile Creek, and as the British approached, Han's force fell back. They realized, "Uh oh, this is a little bit too much for us. But American sharpshooters harassed the British, and they delayed their approach by hours. We're going to see this in other battles too, Scott, how American riflemen and sharpshooters, we would use the word snipers today, but that term was not used back then. It was sharpshooters. And they were very sharp shooters, and they would target officers a lot of the time. And they had they had rifled muskets, so they had much better range than a, a regular musket. They are going to constantly throughout the war be picking off British officers and just harassing British and coming out of nowhere, supposedly or seemingly. And the British just don't know how to deal with that. So anyway, the, so the British advance toward Trenton is slowed down thanks to the sharp shooters. Washington sent more soldiers forward to beef up Han's force, delaying the British even more. And it was almost dark before the British reached the main American position behind the Assunpink Creek. Now, there were three Virginia regiments who protected a bridge across the creek that the British would have to cross to get to the main American force. How many times do you see this in warfare, Scott? You know, you've got a creek or a river, and you can't just make your army wade across it. It's too deep. You don't want to swim because then the other side will come over there and, and shoot at you and kill everybody. Some people probably can't swim anyway. So you've got to have a bridge. So it's kind of like a choke point. Your your army is essentially stopped and they have to narrow down and go across this bridge where they're, again, in a very vulnerable position. And the uh, Americans are going to, again, give the British a really hard time as they try to, as they try to cross this bridge. One American officer supposedly shouted to his men, Well, boys, you know the old boss has put us here to defend the bridge, and by God, it must be done. Bring down your pieces. Fire at their legs. One man wounded in the leg is better than a dead one, for it takes two more to carry him off, and there is three gone. Leg them, damn them. I say leg them. <laughs> That's a great quote, isn't it? The combat surgeon is going to be very busy with amputations later. Yeah, the British, yeah, the British doctors are going, um, did you really have to say that? <laughs> so is that really necessary? Well, uh, sharpen the saws and whip up a batch of either because here we go. Yeah, whatever it takes. Um, the British attacked the Americans and then were driven back twice. I guess there was probably plenty of legging them going on. Washington then sent in his reserves under the command of John Cadwallader. There's the man that we was having trouble earlier. Now he's in the thick of it. The British and the Germans lost about 500. So it's a combined force of British and Hessians. So 500 gone. The British then made a third attack. You got to give them points for trying, right? It's like Bunker Hill again. They just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. 
Maybe the third time will be the charm, but not this time. They stop for the day. Cornwallis decides, all right, that's enough. Three times and we can't get through them. Let's regroup. Let's get some rest. Uh, we'll finish him off in the morning. And Cornwallis is said to have told one of his aides or one of his subordinates, we've got here. Should I do a British accent? Yes, please. Actually, they didn't have British accents back there. That's an interesting side note, but uh, we'll talk about that later if we have time. Uh, so he said, we've got the old fox now. We'll go over there and bag him in the morning. So I did kind of a semi-British accent there. Um, <laughs> yeah, supposedly the British, the, what you think of today is a British accent. Have you read this, Scott? It was like developed in the late 1800s, early 1900s by well, up, upper class British people who were trying to sound more highfalutin, more classy. I've read that it, during the time of the revolution, the British and the Americans actually spoke with just about the same accent. Right. And some have said that the English that you would think of spoken by a genteel Southerner would be closer to British then. This is a little historical aside. If we don't have audio recordings of the past, then we can't know how things sounded except for poetry, because obviously most poetry rhymes. So if you find poetry from a dated period and reading it and you think, well, this rhyming structure doesn't make sense, that can clue us into the pronunciation. And there are even troops of Shakespearean actors, some of which will go back and use the accents of the Shakespearean period because they think that, well, this is what will give it its proper flow and diction as Shakespeare would have intended and the full melody of, of the sound. So that's a little yeah. bit on how we try to guess how people sounded in the past. Cool stuff. Yeah, uh, that's that's a really fascinating stuff. But I guess we should get back to the battle. So if I'm going to quote Cornwallis, I should do kind of like my best Foghorn Leghorn impression. <laughs> is that was that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Let's just go for it. We've got the old fox now. We'll go over and bag him in the morning. I would think anyway, more uh, like a S Savannah, Georgia kind of. But yeah, I don't know. I, right. get, I get my southern accents all mixed up. But anyway, um, so the point is, is that Cornwallis makes a what at least in hindsight seems to be a huge mistake. He's putting off till the morning, assuming Washington's just going to stay there like a gentleman and fight like a man, right? Here's what, by the way, this was a, a very bloody battle. One American soldier wrote, their dead bodies lay thicker and closer together for a space than ever I beheld sheaves of wheat lying in a field over which the reapers had just passed. So a lot of carnage in a very small amount of space. So, okay, the, the sun sets and night falls and the British are resting and they're eating relatively well, certainly much better than the Americans probably did. Expect, and the British are just going to rest up. They're going to wake up early in the morning and finish the Americans off. So when they wake up, they send a few scouts forward and they look across to the American position and guess what they found? They found nothing. Washington, once again, is gone. The whole American army they gave them the slip once again, just like they did back at Brooklyn earlier in this year. What Washington had done is he had taken his army, slipped around the British position during the night and marched toward the remainder of the British army in Princeton. See, Washington doesn't want to play by the British rules. He may not be the most brilliant battlefield tactician ever in history, but he was smart and he knew when to fight and when not to fight. I'm starting to wonder if when Washington was younger, he saved the life of an old gypsy woman who blessed him with the magical spell of luck. Because again, he um, was brave in his retreat, but this is also very lucky that it succeeds. Uh, for example, his only avenue of retreat is over the Delaware River again. And to try to cross under hot pursuit with a superior force under one choke point is... I mean, you're really playing the odds here. And his position behind uh, Assunpink Creek wasn't strong. It could be flanked to the east. There's He's faced with 5,500 veteran British troops, and there's 2,500 within supporting distance. And Washington barely has 5,000 men at this time. So that it works is also lucky. Yeah, and also, not only that, but he's violating a, print, a cardinal rule of military warfare at the time. You do not put yourself between two British forces. Think about that. He's going to getting. He's going around Cornwallis's force camp near Assunpink Creek, and he's going to march north to Trenton, which automatically means 
He has one British force to the north and one to the south. And if Cornwallis could you know, rally his army, roust him up, turn around, do a 180 and head north, Washington would be caught between a rock and a hard place. So, again, I agree with you. Washington was definitely, he was a gambler and he often had very good luck. Not always, but often. He seemed to have it when he needed it. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. All right. So they cross the river. And what's happening in Princeton? All right. So we're going to go march up to Princeton with Washington and the Continental Army. At Princeton, the British had about 2,500 soldiers, so a much smaller group there. And they were under the command of a man named Charles Mahood. Um, Mahood, I looked that up, and I think that's how you pronounce it. On January 3rd, uh, Washington arrives at Princeton. He was threatening to get in the rear of the British forces there. So he's going to do that classic flanking thing, get around behind them. Mahood doesn't want any part of that, so he turned his force around, and, and the British is de- army there at Princeton is deployed around a nearby orchard and a farmhouse. And one of Washington's favorite subordinates... General Hugh Mercer spotted the British and he ordered his soldiers into a battle line. Mercer's force exchanged fire with the British and he fell back. The British conducted a bayonet charge in which Mercer was seriously wounded. I read that the the British stabbed him about seven times or so, or maybe more. I can't remember the exact number. But yeah, they when they were angry, they didn't (laughs) behave as civilized gentlemen. Let's put it that way, especially not to officers. Uh, Cadwallader's troops marched forward, but they got mixed up with Mercer's retreating soldiers. So the American position looks like it's about to collapse. It looks like this gamble of Washington's has not paid off. But then just in time, Washington arrives on the battlefield and he rallied the troops. And he was really good at doing that, too. He was really good at getting people to stop running, turn around and get back in line and start shooting again. He brought in some reinforcements. He organized the Americans into a coherent battle line. And a brigade under General Arthur St. Clair marched toward a group of Mahood soldiers. And these soldiers were holed up in Nassau Hall. And this was on the campus. It was called the College of New Jersey at the time, but later it would be Princeton University. Nassau Hall, to this day, is one of the oldest buildings on that campus. Uh, And these British soldiers inside of Nassau Hall which is basically like a combination dining hall, dormitory, who knows what else. They tried to make it into a fortress. Um, That's not going to work too (laughs) well, is it, Scott? Most dormitories are not designed to be fortresses. Right. I mean, the the modern ones, if they're kind of cinder block squares, could be a little bit more robust. Back then, I don't think so. Yeah, it's going to be made out of wood primarily, if not entirely. And But it's all they had. They didn't really have much of a choice. It was the nearest available building. So the Americans say, let's blast away. So they bombard the building with cannon. Then a group of soldiers charged the building. And just when they were about to break down the door, the British soldiers inside waved a white flag and 194 soldiers surrendered. And that is essentially the end of the Battle of Princeton. These are not long, complicated battles. Again, these are not anything like some of the Civil War battles we talked about, which sometimes go on for several days and have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of men. Cornwallis decides, all right, enough is enough. He withdrew the army. They left Trenton, they left Princeton, and they went to New Brunswick, uh, which is also New Jersey. So Washington is basically one, I'm going to call it three victories in a row. Trenton, is obviously an American victory, overwhelming. Second Trenton, okay, maybe more of a tie, but but Washington at least stopped the British advance, and he was able to do what he wanted to. He had his way, so that's at least a semi-victory. And then, of course, Princeton is a victory, too. A lot of the British soldiers surrender. The rest of them leave. But Washington is still not done. A few days later, American forces took Hackensack, and they took Elizabethtown, and Washington's army took Morristown. So, a great run for Washington and the Continental Army. The British, two weeks before, they had controlled just about all of New Jersey. Now they're combined, confined to just two areas, Amboy and New Brunswick, so two towns. But more importantly, as we've already touched upon, for the Americans, their morale soared. 
Washington's army now believed they were capable of defeating the British. So uh, for once, they're moving forward, they're attacking, they're winning. Uh, even when they're defending, they're fighting off the British instead of just retreating all the time. The rate of desertion decreased. We're going to see that throughout the war. When the Americans win battles, people don't desert as much as they do when you lose battles because you feel like you're part of a winning team. So there you go. This really changes things from where the Americans were standing only a month or two earlier. Washington, he again gambles on British complacency. He is right, and this is what kicks off a lot of these successes. Then he makes his winter camp in Morristown, which is an easy striking distance of the British at New York. And again, Howe still doesn't have a stomach for a winter campaign, even though a British assault could end the revolution. When he stays in Morristown, Washington's laying claim to most of New Jersey. And Benjamin Franklin says at the time that there weren't enough Englishmen willing to die for their country to subdue the growing American nation. Well, at least not at this period in the war. Uh, so I thought I would mention just kind of a wrap up on how different leaders on both sides perform. There is a book by Larry Schweiker on the Revolutionary War. I forget the name, but I'll include in the show notes where he gives assigns grades to different figures. I thought I would look at this because it's interesting. So on the British side, Richard Howe gets a C because he underestimated Washington and this created the opportunity at Trenton. Johann Rall gets a D because he was brave, but he had too much faith in his Hessians as being the most battle-hardened mercenaries in the world. Yeah, and didn't take the Americans seriously. Right. Big mistake. Charles Cornwallis gets an F. <laughs> he could have yeah. defe- he could have defeated Washington, but he waited till the morning. Not moving fast enough. Uh, on the American side, Schweiker gives Washington a B. His plan of attack on Trenton is overly complex, and it was good in theory, but he didn't have the commanders to be able to pull it off. Sort of a Robert E. Lee problem, I guess. And he has his later return to New Jersey was an unnecessary gamble. He staked his command on a night march around the British flank. It worked, but some would say it was reckless. But you can't argue against his personal bravery at Princeton, going into Trenton. What he does to patriot morale is a huge turning point, and he gambles, but his gambles pay off. John Sullivan, he gets a D for his lackluster performance from an incompetent commander. Yeah, I Uh, didn't even mention Sullivan, but I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. And then there's others. <laughs> he does better than Israel Putnam, who never showed up with the reinforcements Washington was expecting. And James Ewing, he lets the weather stop him from even getting across the Delaware. Lastly, John Cadwallader. What would you give him, James? I would give him B minus, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I mean, he got turned away the first on the first day when they were attacking Trenton on Christmas, but... Then he uh, did a, a good job at the Battle of Princeton. So, you know, decent. Yeah, not I'd great, say so. But not horrible. Yeah, I think a B is fair where when he recrosses the Delaware, this allows Washington to follow up the Battle of Trenton with another victory. Not too bad. Much better than the New York campaign, to be sure. Yeah, that the, the New York campaign, the Americans get a D at best. And, <laughs> I mean, they tried. They, You know, I... I I guess they could maybe get a C minus for even surviving, but this has got to be at least a B plus, if not an A minus. Can I say one other thing too? Please. It's time for me to finally mention dun da da dun a movie. Yes. <laughs> now there's not nearly as many movies, at least recent ones. Okay, maybe you might say, well, back in nineteen seven, nineteen thirty seven, there was blah blah blah. But I, I'm more of a recent movie guy, and there's really not nearly as many. Uh, recent movies about the revolution than there are about the Civil War. There's so many about the Civil War. Um, I mean, not not bazillion, but, you know, a, a dozen or so-ish. But um, there's The Patriot. We're going to put that on the shelf for now and talk about it later because that deals with the war in the South. But there's a really good movie that was made for cable, I believe. So it's not real famous, but it's called The Crossing. And it's about the Battle of Trenton. It's, you know, like all Hollywood movies, it sometimes plays fast and loose with the facts. For one thing, in the movie, Washington calls all of his subordinate commanders by their first names. (laughs) 
No, 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 no. no I mean, that, like Washington would never do that. I mean, maybe occasionally one on one, but not in front of everybody. He was very stiff and formal. I mean, it was going to be, you know, General Sullivan, General General Sterling, you know, Colonel Hamilton. It wouldn't be Alex and William and John and all that. I mean, they would um, follow the British pattern of decorum, which not until well into the 20th century and even among many today, a close friend you would refer to by their last name. To refer to someone by their Christian name, as they would call it, you would have to be a family member, essentially. So, yes. Yeah, it would indicate a lack of respect, too. Um, but nevertheless, overall, the movie gets the big picture right. So I strongly recommend that. The, the, the person that plays George Washington is Jeff Daniels, who is a veteran character actor. And he's also in my one of my favorite Civil War movies, Gettysburg. But uh, here, Jeff Daniels is George Washington, and he really does a good job other than the the limitations placed on him by the script. <laughs> There's a few other minor things too, but it, it it essentially gets, as I mentioned, the big picture right. So uh, check that movie out if you can find it. You can, I know you, you probably buy the DVD on, on Amazon or somewhere like that for five bucks. It's it's, or you can maybe find it in your local library. But it's definitely worth watching if you want to uh, get a feel for what it must have been like to be at the Battle of Trenton. All right. Well, I'm glad we're getting to get back into the swing of movie recommendations. True, not as many as the Civil War. By far, World War II has the lion's share of movies. Oh, yeah. Plenty of fertile ground. Stories that haven't been told with the Revolutionary War, but we'll be doing our best to incorporate this as much as possible. So, James, where does the war take us in the next episode? Well, we're going to leave Washington behind. He's going to eventually go into winter camp. And we're going to head north. And we're going to see how the British are going to deal with New York and the New England colonies. They're going to come up with this grand plan to try to cut the colonies in half, to try to use the uh, Hudson River and uh, Fort Ticonderoga and Lake Champlain and that area. They're going to try to take control of that. Hopefully, therefore, you know, cordoning off or isolating the New England colonies, which is where all the trouble started pretty much, and see if they can end the rebellion that way, that way by cutting them in two and isolating New England. And we'll see if that works next time. And listeners, I hope you love Foppish Dandies because we have them by the wagon full with our British officers we're going to meet in the next episode. Oh, so. we're going to have so much fun. Yes. All right. Plenty of wine, women, and song lovers. All right. We'll see you all in the next episode and take you to the Battle of Saratoga. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com, where you'll find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of madeira and raise a toast to liberty. Liberty.